It's a new year and a great time to make some important decisions that will impact the rest of your life. More on that next. From the Churches of Christ, let the Bible speak with evangelist Kevin Presley. I'm happy you've joined me today to spend a little while together in the Word of God. We recently embarked upon a new year and what I think most of us hope will be a new and better chapter of our lives. We mark time by years down here on earth, and so when we turn over the calendar, we also tend to think about turning over a new leaf. Maybe you're taking this time right now because you said this would be the year that I begin reading and studying the Bible, searching for God and His truth. Well, that's a great resolution, and I hope you'll stick to it because it will yield great profits in your life. Unfortunately, though, most of us don't have a very good track record of keeping resolutions. We like the idea, but when it comes to putting in the work, we easily become discouraged and fall back into our old habits. And so year after year passes, and we've not really made any progress. Goals are not reached, promises not kept, and dreams are left in the dust. And that new you is forgotten, and we come to realize the old us is still right there, eating, spending, sitting, just like we always have. But it doesn't have to be that way. But many of us could testify to the fact that it often is that way. And it has been that way for a long, long time. I would remind you that it took the Israelites 40 years to complete a move that should have taken a few days. They walked, around, uh, they walked across the Red Sea and marched out of Egypt in great victory and resolve to inherit the land that God had promised their father Abraham 400 years later. But their faith foundered and the vision vanished and their march to Canaan became a long and hard slog through the desert wilderness that amounted to 40 years. And of the hundreds of thousands of Hebrews that left Egypt with Moses, only two of them finally entered Canaan. In fact, even Moses failed to reach it. When we come to the Old Testament book of Joshua, though, they're finally entering the land. And the first several chapters of Joshua are about victory. They cross the rolling Jordan, uh, they began to take the land. They conquered Jericho. Uh, they began to uh, take the land that God said they would possess. But Joshua knew the long history of these people. And now being an old man, over 100 years old, who was about to die, he feared for their future. He knew their tendency to turn aside. And so he gathers them at Shechem, the very place where God had promised Abraham this land hundreds of years ago. And at this significant patriarchal site, he preaches his farewell sermon. He takes them back through their history. He shows them how God, through all of their victories, defeats, trials, and challenges, how God had brought them by His grace to where they now stood. And then there was a challenge, a solemn warning. And read with me in Joshua 24, beginning in verse 14. He says, Now therefore fear the Lord, and serve Him in sincerity and in truth and Put away the gods which your fathers served on the other side of the flood, or the river, and in Egypt, and serve ye the Lord. And if it seem evil unto you to serve the Lord, choose you this day whom ye will serve, whether the gods which your fathers served that were on the other side of the flood, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land ye dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord." Joshua's declaration of he and his family's faith and commitment is one of the most courageous and resolute statements ever made. But Joshua was just one man. What would the nation do? He's telling them that this was a day of decision. And that's what I want to talk to you about today. You may be like a multitude of others who are, you might say, sitting on the fence. You may be carelessly drifting or aimlessly wandering through life with no spiritual direction. And like then, today is also a day of decision. And I want to challenge you to make some important decisions today that I promise will change your life in just a moment. The Apostle Paul saw the gospel as a sacred trust, saying in 1 Thessalonians 2 and verse 5 that he didn't use flattering words nor a cloak of covetousness. But yet preachers week after week come into our living rooms with their handout, we don't expect you to fund our ministry or to pay to hear the gospel. Therefore, let the Bible speak is different. 
This program is brought to you by a local congregation of the Church of Christ in your community who simply want to reach out and spread the truth of New Testament Christianity. We thank you for watching Let the Bible Speak, and we hope that you'll tell someone else about this program and encourage them to see the difference. For the of Joshua 24 and verse 15 are quite familiar. Choose ye this day whom you will serve, and as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Throughout their 400 year history, and even throughout the history of the human race, men haven't been faithful to God for very long. Idolatry was and is an ever-present temptation. Even Abraham, the father of the Jewish race, was at one time an idolater who was raised and Ur of the Chaldees near ancient Babylon, and had to renounce the many gods of his past in order to follow the one true God who would ultimately bless him. Abraham's children were confronted with the temptation to worship strange gods throughout their generations, whether it was the mythical gods of the Egyptians or the many false gods of the Canaanites in the land that they were now conquering. And Joshua now knew that as they possessed the land and encountered the culture and religion of the Canaanites, their history would come back to haunt them, and they would be tempted to turn to paganism and fail to be a separate people dedicated to God alone. And so he tells them in Joshua chapter 24 that this was a day of decision. They had choices before them. They could worship the idols that their fathers had worshipped on the other side of the river. They could choose which gods they would serve and bow to. Or they could wholly give themselves to the true God of heaven. He said, my family has made our decision, and no matter what you decide to do, and no matter what God you choose to worship, he says, my house, we're going to serve the Lord. My, my, how we need some Joshua's in this day of worldliness and conformity. I mean, people with the faith, courage, and resolve to stand up and say, if nobody else will, I'll serve the Lord. If everybody else lives in sin and hates and rejects the truth, and I have to be all alone, that's all right. I'm going to serve the Lord. If everyone else embraces religious error and false doctrine and false worship, well, that's not going to change my decision and my commitment to do just what the Bible says. Yes, we need some Joshua's today. Well, when Joshua said that, it did the same thing that a stirring speech might do to people today. It got the people all stirred up emotionally, caught up in the moment, and they replied, well, yes, we'll serve the Lord. Why, why would we not? Surely you don't think we would worship pagan idols. But you see, Joshua knew them through and through. He knew their past. He knew how weak and fickle they could be. And so he chided them a bit, and he says in verses 15 and 20, he says, ye cannot serve the Lord, for he is an holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your transgressions nor your sins. If ye forsake the Lord and serve strange gods, then He will turn and do you harm and consume you after that He hath done you good. In other words, you say you'll be faithful to God, but if you don't do any differently than you have in the past, after a while you'll forget all about this and go right back to your old ways. But they assured Joshua in verse 21, perhaps even more vociferously, no, but we will serve the Lord. Joshua said, all right, your witnesses that you've committed yourselves to forsake idolatry and only worship God. And they said, the Lord, our God, will we serve and his voice will we obey. And so with that resolution, the Bible says that Joshua renewed the covenant there with the people. 
He took a large stone, he erected a monument to serve as a witness to the vow that they had made to be faithful and serve the Lord, and he dismissed the people to their inheritance, and he soon died. Well, we need to make some decisions today. So many of us are fickle, undependable. We talk a good game about our faith, our religion. Uh, we might admit how much we fall short. We might even say, well, we're going to do differently. But we've never in our heart of hearts made the decisions that need to be made. You remember before the famous showdown at Mount Carmel, Elijah the prophet gathered the people together and made a similar statement to Joshua's in 1 Kings chapter 18 and verse 21. The Bible says, Elijah came unto the people and said, How long halt ye between two opinions? If the Lord be God, follow Him. But if Baal, then follow Him. And the people answered him, not a word. Well, are you halting between two opinions today? Do you know what's right, but you've not committed to do right? There are a lot of people that fall into that category. Well, I want to talk about some things that require a great decision. And my friend, as we stand on the precipice of a new year filled with new opportunities and a clean sheet on which to write, it is a great time to make these decisions. It is truly a day of decision for you. First of all, I want to say that it's time to decide to obey God. Jesus said in Luke chapter 6 and verse 46, Why call ye me Lord, Lord, and do not the things which I say? And there are many people that call Jesus Lord, but they don't really submit to Him as Lord. I, I know a man who until a few years ago would argue with everyone he got the chance to argue with, that a person had to be baptized into Christ to receive the remission of sins. Acts 2 and verse 38 teaches that. He knew that's what the Bible says. He believes that's what the Bible says. And he would tell you that that's what the Bible says. Uh, he would tell you that if you're not following the Bible in your worship and in your life, well, you're wasting your time calling yourself a Christian. But yet he himself had never been baptized. He himself was not serving the Lord within his church until a few years ago he finally made up his mind and was immersed into Christ. There are a lot of people like that. There are also a lot of people who, like Israel of old, like to claim God as their Father. They today like to claim that Jesus is their Savior, but they won't make Him their Lord. Uh, there are people that think of Jesus as their friend, but not their Master. But my friend, good thoughts about Jesus won't save you. Praying or crying out to Jesus won't save you. Owning a Bible or displaying a cross in your home or on your clothing, that, that doesn't save you. God's grace through obedient faith saves you. And so many want to live their lives today on their terms. They want to remain a part of the world, hold on to a sinful practice or lifestyle. They don't want to, really, they don't want to leave the life of sin. But yet somehow they think that Christ is going to save them. They may say, well, I believe it. I believe in Jesus. Well, not if you're not going to obey Him. And that's the simple fact of the matter. Hebrews 5 and verse 9 says that Christ is the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. He didn't say He's the author of salvation unto all who believe that what He said is true. He said He's the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey Him. Have you been baptized into Christ? Are you a faithful and dependable member and worker in His church? Are you gathering with the church to worship Him according to the Scriptures, faithfully, steadfastly, like the Bible says Christians are to do upon the first day of the week? If not, why don't you decide? Why don't you finally make up your mind to obey the Lord today? Submit to Him. If you really believe He is who He claims to be, and the Bible says that He is, start obeying Him. Resolve today that you're going to step out and obey the gospel and begin living the life that He calls you to live. Number two, it's time to decide to give up sin. Now, you know the Bible teaches that sin can be left behind, that sin can be conquered through Christ. And it makes repentance of sin a requirement, a prerequisite to forgiveness. In fact, in Romans chapter 6, Paul illustrates how the Christian uh, was forgiven and made free from sin and baptism and raised to a new life in Christ. In verses 3 through 6, he beautifully, beautifully illustrates that. And then he says in verse 12, let not sin therefore reign in your mortal body. What does he mean? How does sin reign within a person? Now all of us have been guilty of sin. The Bible says, in fact, in 1 John 1 and verse 8, if a man says he has no sin, he deceives himself and the truth is not in him. 
But yet the Bible also says that sin is not to reign in our mortal body. So what's the difference? Well, I might illustrate it like this. There's a big difference between a thief who breaks into your home and a person you invite inside. If a burglar sneaks into your home and ransacks the place and steals your belongings, you didn't want him there. You may have unknowingly left the door unlocked or a window open, but you certainly didn't turn the covers down in the guest room for him. And once it happens, you'll certainly be more vigilant to keep him out in the future. Well, sin is an intruder. It's an interloper in the life of a Christian. But sin dwells in the heart and life of a sinner. But you see, the Christian has evicted the devil from his heart and life. There are many people who profess to be Christians, but they have never evicted sin from their life. They never really repented of their sin and committed themselves to live a godly and a holy life. And consequently, Christ doesn't dwell in such a one's heart by faith because sin never left. And the Lord's not going to live in a dirty house. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse 11, Paul said, Of all kinds of sins of the flesh, such as sexual sins and sins of the heart, he said, They which do such things shall not inherit the kingdom of God. Are there sins in your life that you've refused to repent of? Have they even become destructive and debilitating habits and addictions? I've got good news for you, my friend. Those chains can be broken today. Jesus holds the keys, and He will empower you to overcome those things. But you've got to yield to Him in repentance and obedience. You've got to make up your mind to give it up and let Christ change your life. I read of some people practicing things they had no business, to be in, uh, no business being involved in in Acts chapter 19. And when they were finally convicted of their sinful ways, the Bible says, beginning there in Acts 19 verse 18, that many that believed came and confessed and showed their deeds. Many of them also which used curious arts brought their books together and burned them before all men. And they counted the price of them and found it 50,000 pieces of silver and so mightily grew the word of God and prevailed. Now that's repentance. That's what you call a day of decision for those people. But number three, it's really time that you put the church and Christ Jesus first in your life. You know, Jesus made that imperative. He declared in His Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 and verse 33, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and His righteousness, and all of these things will be added unto you. These things referring to the things, the necessities, the temporal things of life. Jesus says, put the kingdom first in your life. Seek God's kingdom. Seek His righteousness first and foremost. And the things of this physical life will take care of themselves. Have you become derelict in your duty to the kingdom of the Lord? Have you shirked your responsibility to the church, to the cause of Christ? Are you, as we sometimes say, out of duty? Have you allowed your job or your family, your goals and dreams in life, or maybe something as simple as recreation, worldly interests, to crowd out the things that are far more important. It's very easy to do. Jesus, in fact, once said that the thorns of worldliness and earthly cares will choke the seed in the heart of a Christian until it dies altogether. Why don't you get back where you ought to be? Stop saying a better time or when it's easier or when it's more convenient. Because, friend, that'll never happen. There will never be a more opportune moment in your life. And I want, you to, I want you to listen to this carefully. There will never, ever be a more opportune moment in your life to make a decision that will impact the rest of your life and where you will spend eternity than right now. Today, how long halt ye between two opinions? Elijah asked. Joshua said, choose you this day whom you will serve. Sometimes getting our priorities straight is a real challenge. I mean, if we just begin to make a list of all the things that are important in life that we think are important, the things that we have to do, and some of them are very necessary. Cares of this life are not inherently evil. It's necessary that a man work for a living. The Bible says if a man won't work to provide for his household, that he's worse than an infidel. He's denied the faith. The Bible says if a man won't work, neither should he eat. 
Bible commands us to work for what we have, for what we eat. Uh, Education is a wonderful theme. Uh, there's nothing wrong with certain kinds of recreation and relaxation. Nothing wrong with enjoying a ball game. Nothing wrong with going fishing or going to the woods and enjoying a hunting trip. There's nothing wrong with any of those things necessarily. But how often and in how many lives do those things come between a person and their service to the Lord? Now, if you begin to approach life by saying, well, I'm just going to try to rearrange things, and I'm going to try to maybe cut down on this a little bit and cut down on that a little bit so I can squeeze in a little time for this and I can squeeze in a little more time for that. And if you treat the Lord and if you treat your duty to God, if you treat the Christian life, if you treat attending worship, if you treat uh, studying the Bible uh, and all of the various things that are involved in living for the Lord Jesus, if you treat those things that way, let me tell you something, you'll never be successful. Uh, you'll always be a failure in trying to live the Christian life. You're not going to be faithful. Uh, there's an old illustration that puts it so well. It said that there was a professor of business who stood before his class one time at a prestigious university, and uh, he performed a rather strange um, experiment, I guess you might say. He took out an empty pail, and he put it on his desk, and he took out some, uh, he, he, he took out some uh, uh, large rocks, and he put them down into the bottom of the pail till they finally came up to the top of it. And then he asked the class, he said, now, is this bucket full? Well, a few of them impetuously raised the hand and they said, well, yes, the bucket looks full. He'd filled the bucket with rocks, so it seemed. And he said, oh, but no, the bucket's not full. And he showed them what he meant. He reached under the desk and he pulled out a pail of gravel finer gravel, and he poured it into the pail until it finally came up to the brim of the bucket. And he said, now is the bucket full? Well, it didn't take them long to catch on, and uh, they were rather bright, and they said, no, no, the bucket's not full. They understood there was something that could displace even those smaller rocks, and he said, you're right. He reached under the desk, and he pulled out a pail of sand, and he poured the sand into the bucket until the bucket, or until the sand came uh, brimming over the top of the bucket, and he said, now is the bucket full? Well, they thought about it a moment, and they said, no, the bucket's really not full. And he said, you're right. And he took out a container of water, and he poured that water until the water soaked down in amongst the grains of sand and the rocks beneath, until finally the bucket could hold no more, and the water began to spill out on top of the desk. And he said, now is the bucket full? And they thought, and they said, yes, it appears to us that the bucket is full. And he said, that's right. He said, now what do we learn from this? And one of the students said, well, this is a lesson in uh, managing our time. And it teaches us that if we'll just learn to balance and manage our time right, that we can always find a way to fit something else in. And he said, uh, no, that's not what we learn. He said, what this teaches us is that those large rocks that I put in the bucket to begin with, he said, you have to put those in first or you would never get them in there. Now, that's the way it is with life. There are some very big things that have to go in our lives and they have to go in there first or you'll never fit them in. And the problem with so many of us is we attend to things that really in the big scheme of things don't matter that much. And we make sure that we put those things into their rightful place within our lives. And then we go searching for God. Then we go trying to uh, include spiritual things and spiritual activities in our life. We kind of treat the kingdom of God as a sort of a checklist, a to-do list. And we try to weave all that in with our busy schedule and find a little time here and find a little time there to devote to God and devote to Bible study to devote to the kingdom, but that's not how it's done. If you really want to serve the Lord, if you want to love the Lord with all your mind, soul, heart, strength, all that you have and all that you are, if you really want to seek first the kingdom of God, you've got to put that in there first. You have to make a resolution. You have to make a decision, and you have to say that spiritual things the work of the church, my worship to God, my relationship to God will come before everything else. And then you let everything else find its place within your life. 
You know, this year can be a great year of spiritual beginnings, perhaps spiritual renewal for you. But you've got to make up your mind for it to be so. And if you'll make that decision today, the Lord will help you. And I pray that you will. I hope today will be a day of decision for you. I hope that you'll make up your mind, if you're not already, to serve the Lord with all that you are and all that you have. And I promise you, the Lord will help you if you make that resolution. We will help you. If you'd like to reach out to us, to have someone come and study the Bible with you, it'd be our joy to do that, to show you what the Bible says about what to do to be saved, how to serve and worship the Lord, how to get started in living a Christian life and growing in the grace and knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You can make this a wonderful year and you can set the course for the rest of your life. And I hope you'll seize this precious opportunity to do so. If you'd like a copy of today's lesson, a printed transcript, we'll send it to you free of cost. Just get in touch with us and ask for the lesson, Day of Decision. I'm sure glad you chose to join me for this study of God's Word. I hope that you'll make it a habit this year as we continue from week to week, the Lord willing, to open the Scriptures and let the Bible speak. Have a great week, and Lord willing, I'll see you back here next time. Let the Bible Speak is brought to you by your friends in the Churches of Christ.